Hi, I'm Chad Vanderveen, Technology and Politics Editor for Government Technology. In the July issue of our magazine, I wrote a story that examines the increasingly diverse realm of virtual worlds, from online role-playing games to motion capture technology. Today on GTTV, we'll take a look at one of the most compelling virtual worlds, that of Microsoft's Virtual Earth. A glimpse of what Virtual Earth is capable of can be seen in this Microsoft-produced video. Here, Virtual Earth takes us on an aerial tour of New York City. The level of detail is impressive, and one can't help but think back to the days when most people scoffed at GIS for being nothing more than a map on a computer. For my story, I interviewed John Kurlander, General Manager for Virtual Earth. Virtual Earth represents an attempt to create an immersive, highly realistic digital version of Earth. It's an Earth on which a visitor can travel from Tokyo to London in seconds, yet still get a sense of what these cities look and even feel like. From the gritty alleyways to the soaring skyscrapers, Virtual Earth aspires to be just that, our planet packaged in cyberspace, the virtual universe we've become so accustomed to. Kurlander is intrigued by the possibilities of a fully rendered three-dimensional Earth. Could this be the next step in the evolution of GIS? From a government perspective, Kurlander said Virtual Earth could be, for example, in the position to change the way Homeland Security responds to threats against major population centers. We see a lot of interest from the government. One of the most obvious areas is Homeland Security. So with, a, with accurate, you know, detailed 3D models of cities, that's a valuable asset for emergency responders, uh, planners of uh, scenarios on how to, how to respond to emergencies, things like that, that would support the Homeland Security uh, application. And we do have a, already a lot of inquiries from cities, uh, police departments, fire departments, and so on about the data and, and using the models and so on. Another possible application for Virtual Earth is a bit more pedestrian, urban planning. And while perhaps not as exciting as Homeland Security, having a richly detailed model of Earth at your fingertips could help planners in a variety of ways. The traditional urban planning application for this kind of data, I think what, we're, what would probably historically be the province of a, a GIS type application, we can handle a lot of the, the needs with the virtual Earth database. The data quality is high enough that it meets a large percentage of the applications that, say, an urban planner or any, or any of the city users would need. And that is, they, they won't need to have custom flights done to collect their data. They won't need to have custom processing done to create their products. They could simply access the virtual Earth databases through our viewer and get most of what they need from that, if not all. I see a transition over to using this data. This will happen pretty easily, just just for the budget reasons, if nothing else. While watching the New York video, you might ask yourself what kind of computing muscle it takes to run an application like this. As PC gamers know all too well, high-end graphics mean high-end components, if you want the best resolution. It's unlikely that small local government will be easily convinced to invest capital in a heap of top-of-the-line video cards and CPUs. But Kurlander said Microsoft will help soften the blow to hardware costs by hosting much of Virtual Earth itself. It is a lot of compute power to make these systems run. For example, I have one stage in the processing that uh, on 16 CPUs it runs for around 670 hours straight. It uses 100% of the CPUs, runs for 70 hours. And that's roughly, a th say, a thousand image block. What we're planning to do is to process the data as a service and then we make the finished product available to the government so they don't have to. I mean, what we're trying to do really is free the government from having this uh, big infrastructure that's required to work with geospatial data. So just like you could, just like these big data centers that Microsoft or MSN has serving out all kinds of applications for the consumer community, we can do a similar kind of thing with the geospatial data all the work is done in a centralized data center, and then that's served out to the broader community. The images in Virtual Earth are stunning to look at. If you're not careful, you can spend hours touring big cities or rocketing off to traverse towering mountains. But how much is enough? To what level of detail do Microsoft and Kurlander want to bring Virtual Earth? We're interested in 
that kind of detail on the buildings. We would like to know where every door is on every building, right? Because we want to be able to geocode all the doors. So when somebody's looking to find a restaurant, we can take them right to the door rather than to that area in the block sure. of where that restaurant is. So ultimately, we want to be, and we also, if somebody, say, searches for a restaurant, we'd like to bring up a photo of the restaurant that's actually the restaurant and not the, the establishment next door. If you talk to emergency responders, police, or fire, they would say having that kind of detailed knowledge would be incredibly valuable for them to put a plan what they're doing, including knowing where the windows are and other kinds of structures that might impede a vehicle from getting close to the building and so on. So they, they like to have that kind of detail. Microsoft Virtual Earth represents just one of a growing number of brave new virtual worlds. The challenge for government today is figuring out where it fits in in this strange and changing cyberscape. Millions of people are spending more of their time exploring online realms. Can the day be far off when these netizens start to wonder why they can find anything they want in the virtual world, anything, that is, except government? This is Chad Vanderveen for GTTV.